Good morning and welcome to Safari Live. My name is Brent Yeosmith. I have Andrew Francis on camera. There's James and Tebbs in the other vehicle and Geraldine and Louise in final control. A uh, big thanks to Lucy. You mentioned that there were alarm calls at the Juma Dam. Uh, and I don't think the alarm calls were due to the hyena. Um, if it was in Palo or in Yala, uh, it might be something else. They very seldom alarm call at hyena. Have a look, maybe there's a leopard around. Uh, that's what piqued the hyena's interest as well. Doesn't look like it's too interested in anything. Just moving on through the bush. Uh, I think it's possibly one of the same hyenas that caused a little bit of havoc in our lives last night. Uh, just check the tracks here quickly. And it's going to disappear off into the bush. And we're going to leave it be. I don't think it's particularly going after anything. I think it's just foraging. So we won't point any fingers, but uh, last night at camp, someone forgot to put the rubbish bin inside and it was stolen by the hyena who managed to drag it out of the camp, find a hole in the fence, drag it through the hole in the fence and then eat the dustbin as well as the contents of the dustbin. bit of camp raiding last night and hyenas. So as long as there's been people, hyenas have scavenged off us, so it is, believe it or not, natural behavior. And I've got a challenge from a Karen, who is the Zimba living in London. And Karen said her biggest tiger fish caught in Lake Kariba is nine pounds or so challenges me to do better. Karen, I do have some bad news for you. Um, my biggest tiger fish caught in the was about 14 pounds. Uh, and that was was a long time ago though. But so I accept the challenge for the next next holiday. Andrew, are you in? Do you think you can beat a nine pound tiger? Yes, yes, yes. I shall be t undertaking quite a challenge in itself, um, and that's going on holiday with Andrew. Uh, and firstly, I think I'm going to try to teach Andrew how to fly fish, which could be quite funny. I can see him hooking himself quite a few times with a large tiger fly behind the ear. check past the Gallego waterhole. Uh, if nothing there, I'm going to head up towards Zoe's, hopefully find some tracks of Karula. And while we do that, uh, let us go to James and Tebs so they can bid you good morrow. Good morning, good morning everybody. I hope you're all very well, depending on the uh, morning, afternoon, evening, night, wherever it happens to be, wherever you are in the world. You, of course, are here as the uh, grey dawn has broken in the northeastern corner of South Africa. My name is James Hendry. On camera is uh, Tebs. Hello, Tebs. There's Tebs' thumb. 
and the weather is about 20 degrees Celsius, 68 degrees Fahrenheit at the moment, so quite chilly, a little bit of a breeze coming in from the southeast, and that's what's brought in this cloud. Now there's an Impala running gently along the side of the road. They're not running nearly fast enough, in my opinion. We've come along this way um, in the hopes of trying to find some wild dogs. There they are. Not the dogs, the Impala. And the wild dogs were seen inside, just north of the road we're on now, just inside Lofoshoek, yesterday evening. And I'm hoping that they've come across. I did see a vehicle coming this way earlier on and asked them. They uh, certainly didn't seem to indicate that they had seen anything that looked vaguely like a wild dog. So that's a bit of a disappointment, but we'll keep looking. It's only just got sort of light uh, because of the thick clouds, so we might be lucky. So that's the general plan for the morning. That plan will possibly change dependent on updates we get from the radio. And we are normally first out the Wild Earth crew. We kick off at five. The rest of them are sort of waking their guests up round about now and then shoveling them onto the vehicles at about half past five, leery eyed and um, slowly waking up as the effects of the strong caffeine take their, take their toll. Like I was saying yesterday, just about today, just about as Teb spotted the wild dogs, um, it's about the only holiday you can go on where you're forcibly ejected from the comfort of your slumber and they have a half past four or five o'clock in the morning. So this is the northern boundary we're on, like I say. And we're just going to keep an eye on the road and, of course, on the side of the road where I'm hoping Tim and the Eagle Eye are going to spot us some wild dogs. And the cloud, of course, is a mercy at this time of the year because it has been so very hot. Ah, this is a story I haven't told for some time. And Pat in Arizona, you've noticed the castles of clay that we drive past. Um, and they are indeed, as you say, termite mounds. And you want to know how they get so big? Just over time, Pat. Um, the termites will probably build almost a cubic meter in a year. And so here's a nice big termite mound over here. Have a look at it. This is quite a good idea, Pat, just to stop and listen anyway. So we'll stop and listen and look at this termite mound. the termite mound pat and it's not a lot bigger than it actually looks it's a uh, you can see the bit sticking out the 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 ground and it's a bit like the proverbial tip of the iceberg where uh, there's a quite a lot more of it underground and quite a lot more of it i mean it extends probably tebs there's a green bush just in front of us there and the base of the mound is just in front of that green bush so it's an enormous construction. And like I said, probably about a cubic meter a year. Um, a cubic meter in um, feet would be sort of a, nine cubic feet of uh, soil a year. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger as long as the queen survives. And the queen is un under the ground. She's normally about that big, which is about half a foot in length. And she lays 20,000 eggs a day. And all of those eggs will either turn into alates, which will turn into the flying termites, or they will turn into soldiers, or they'll turn into workers. And it's the workers and their saliva, their dung, and their collection of soil that makes these incredible mounds of clay. This particular termite is called Macrotermes natalensis, or the large fungus-growing termite. And that's because they've got a whole fun complex arrangement of fungus gardens underneath the ground there, Pat. Where, which they use to help digest the cellulose, for which they lack the digestive enzymes. Right, nice one. Thank you, Pat. And any more questions on termites, please fire them through. And anybody who's wondering how on earth Pat managed to ask me that question, um, she's on Twitter. Send to a tweet, hashtag Safari Live, or questions at wildearth.tv if you're on the email.
going down through a dodgy area here. Let's head across to Brent and I will see you shortly. We've checked past the Gallagher waterhole. Nothing there. I'm just doing a quick circle of the quarantine clearings before heading further out. To see what it's about. Down the road and I didn't know it. I'll generally leave that type of stuff to James. I'll stick to finding it. X Ranger on Twitter would like to know are Brent and Andrew a little bit stiff after our foot race yesterday? Of course not. We are fine examples of a physical specimen tuned by hours in the bush driving on bumpy roads. So, no, or maybe Andrew is, I'm not sure. Andrew? I'm ready for round two. He's ready for round two. Do I see another challenge? So there seems to have been some debate that I cut Andrew off yesterday, which is not true. I was so far in front of him it was easy to overtake him. Uh, it might have looked that way. Okay. We'll see if, if, if there is a round two in us. And I don't think it's something we should overdo. Maybe once a week. so they move between areas so they're never permanently in one spot and at the moment with the lack of rain and the pans not filling up it's unlikely that they're going to be here but there is always a chance so i will definitely keep my eyes open for a black stalk we have seen them before a couple of months ago Ontario, Canada. Uh, Mary Beth would like to know if there are peacocks in Africa, or in South Africa particularly. Uh, Mary Beth, they are not. Uh, the most common peacock that everyone knows is actually from India. Uh, we do not get all, they are introduced, there are some introduced. There is a peacock species in Africa, but it is incredibly rare. Uh, and it also lives in the most inaccessible part of the Congo Basin rainforests, and it's called the Congo Peacock. I'll show you a picture of one now. And it was only discovered in the 50s, so that's how inaccessible that forest it lives in is, that it was only discovered in the 50s. Uh, it lives in a very specific area between the River Cross and the River Congo, in the same area uh, where bonobos live, The peacock. I, I, I think so. Andrew, you've been in there. I haven't. So. Anyway, Andrew, Andrew's given me a dollop of information that uh, the peacock is the national bird of India. Of course, been one of the largest birds. I'm struggling to find. Well, there's a picture of it on the cover. That is a male Congo peacock. They have got very, very strange calls. And it is one of the birds that is on my hit list. To give you an idea 
how remote and how difficult uh, the area to see them is. Uh, firstly, there is no sort of uh, lodges or commercial ventures. Uh, there's one Max Planck Research Institute in Salanga National Park uh, where you can go see Congo peacocks that are researching bonobos. I've had a few friends who've worked there. Uh, so basically you would have to fly to the bustling metropolis, also sometimes known as a hellhole, that is Kinshasa, uh, which is the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And once you have reached this, you must stay in your designated area so you are not kidnapped for ransom. Then you have to get onto a charter plan, which can cost anything from a four to eight thousand dollars one way and it lands at a very rural village that there are no cars at no roads you can't even get there by road and a clearing in the forest uh, once you have landed there uh, you then load all your equipment onto your back uh, and there will be porters who also load the rest of the stuff on your back and you walk for about nine hours to get to that camp so very very inaccessible Poaching is quite bad in that area as well. That's what you would have to go through to see the Congo peacock. Oh, I feel a few drops. No apologies necessary. Shamrock would like to know, is a dustbin the same as a garbage can? It is exactly the same, and that is what the hyena ate last night. Hyenas can eat some very funny things. I found paraffin lanterns that have been absolutely chewed to pieces by hyenas. Pine would like to know what the dustbin or trash can was made of. It was made of polyurethane, if that helps any. So uh, a plastic uh, that you are able to dump hot ash or something to put stuff in. Uh, very durable plastic, but not durable enough that you stand against the gnashing jaws of a crocutter, crocutter, the spotted hyena. Good morning, Impala Lars. Last year's babies. Let's see how much they've grown in a year. You can see the flies are already out on the impala. Amazing, an actual amazing species impala. You can see it's grazing grass at the moment, but it's one of the few that browse and graze, so it eats both grass and leaves. And then if you have a look on the back legs, that dark round things are called metatarsal glands. And there's a couple of different theories. Uh, no one's 100% sure what they're there for. Well, one theory is when they are chased by a predator, it releases a pheromone that is supposed to confuse them. Uh, I think that's uh, a very, very, very long shot or tall order. Uh, the more plausible explanation is that when they are chased by predators, they release that pheromone so the herd can come back together afterwards. And we have the metatarsal glands. You can see that little shiver on the skin, and it's a little nerve reaction to keep flies off the animal's body. Yes, so we're talking about you. Yeah. Uh, let's go 
see if we can find any tracks of Karula, the Queen of Juma. search of the wild African bush. Let us go see what another wild creature in the bush. James Henry is up to. Right, there are some ring-necked doves, everyone. And, uh, of course, we do see them quite often, and we certainly hear them very often. And they make that very delightful sort of dawn sound. But we seldom actually look at them. So there they are, in all their splendiferous glory. And what they're looking for on the road is probably grass seeds that have been sort of uh, discarded there or pushed onto the road by cars going past, and possibly the odd insect as well. The humble ring necked dove, which doesn't seem to have much to recommend it, other than the fact that they are incredibly fast flyers. Um, probably faster off the mark than most birds out here. And that's because one of their major predators in many areas, of course, are falcons. And in order to get away from a falcon, you've got to be pretty quick. So we're just sitting here listening now, and this is where the dogs were last seen yesterday, well, yesterday morning. Then they went north into Biffles Hook. We're now heading due south down the eastern boundary I haven't found no further tracks at all, which is a bit of a sadness. And I've just watched a spider climb into the microphone. That's quite interesting. Uh, hopefully it won't bite Tebs on the nose during the course of the morning. So no further tracks. I don't know what's happened with them. Certainly no one's mobile yet. None of the game drives seem to be out yet. Uh, they're missing the best part of the morning, of course. So we've just been listening to see if we can hear some impala alarm calls or any other ante antelope alarming. It's uh, all rather pleasantly peaceful at the moment, just the old bird in the bush around us. So I think we shall continue. We'll head off to Buffelshook Dam and see what we can find there. So those dogs will start to get moving as soon as it gets, uh, to, at really first light, they'll start to move and they'll go hunting. Twice a day they'll hunt to feed those hungry pups we still don't seem to be moving with them on the hunt. And the way we know that, of course, is that yesterday we only saw three of them. Sorry, I just had a comment from Jerry and I didn't quite get it. Jerry, can you go again with that, please? A spider web on the lens from the spider that we saw crawling, apparently. <laughs> there we go. That's Tebs' lens cloth that you can see there. Hello, Claire in New York. You're obviously ornithologically minded and you want to know if we get any wood hoopoos here. Yes, we get two versions of wood hoopoos. We get the green wood hoopoo, which used to be known as the red-billed wood hoopoo. And we also get something called a scimitable, which is another kind of a wood hoopoo. And while I roll gently down this road, I will find you a picture of both of them. With any luck. Uh, and I'll also try not to crash off the Wood hoopoo, wood hoopoo. We also get standard issue hoop hoopoos, of course. And they're all on the same page, so you will see them. Right, there they are. So, Claire, the two wood hoopoos 
that we get are number one and number three. Number two, the southern violet wood hoopoe is found only in Namibia. Yep. And both of those received um, pretty often. The scimitar bull's got the most lovely call. Normally at the middle of the day, it just goes. It just sort of floats out over the heat of the midday. Lovely call. And the green wood hoopoe, of course, has a totally different call. Uh, also known as the uh, laughing women. And then, Keith, you want to know about the world's largest bird, um, an, ox, an ostrich. Do we get them here? We do sometimes. Every so often an ostrich pops through. It's not ideal habitat for them. There are lots in the Kruger Park, um, but more in the open areas. They need space to see what's coming to get them. And they don't like these woodland areas. They make them, it makes them feel unsafe, and with a very good reason. They obviously, their main defense is to run away at great speed. And you can imagine that's quite difficult through this woodland that we're driving through now. So I've never seen an ostrich at Juma. I've seen them one in the Sabi Sands before. Pine, you were watching me climb onto that termite mound. You want to know? Um, you, you're very worried for my safety. Thank you for that. And you want? You, you, you're fearful that I might fall into it. Um, but Penny, it is like cement, like you suggest. You can't fall into them. And inside is a is a matrix, a network of little tunnels, probably about that fat. And so while bits of it can be crushed, um, unless there's a very large burrow in the middle and some serious structural faults within the mound itself, um, it's almost impossible to fall into. I've climbed many, many and not fallen into any. Now, Carl, just back onto the termite mounds, you want to know if you can sort of assume that the size of the mound is replicated underneath the ground in terms of soil and tunnels. Well, I mean, not in terms of soil, because obviously they don't deposit soil under the ground, they take it out. Uh, but certainly in terms of tunnels, absolutely, you can assume that it, some of them go right down to the water table. And in some cases here, that's 50 meters or so. So a very long way. So actually larger under the ground than they are over the ground. Tracks there of a very, very large elephant bull. They seem to have headed off. Right, we're now arriving at Bivelshoek Dam, or Bivelshoek Desert, as it has now become. And there's still some mud in the dam, so if you happen to be a hot hippopotamus or a, um, a buffalo or a warthog, then this is still quite a good place to come and try and find some mud. But otherwise, it's pretty solid in there. We'll just switch off again and have a bit of a listen. Just to see if we can't hear any terrified animals calling. So, you know, I mean, like I say, I have said a few times, this dam has not dried up apparently for 20 years. This gives you an indication of the dryness and the drought that we're experiencing, and I can't remember going without proper rain for this length of time in all the years that I've been in the Sabi Sands. And I was chatting to some guys from Londolozi two nights ago and they both agreed. We, we were just all saying how we just feel slightly tired all the time. And it's the sapping heat. They both agreed that they had not experienced a summer like this before in this area. So 
oh, and you see these big thick clouds in the morning, we're always rather grateful because we know that we're not going to cook to death before too early. Right, that's all that's going on here, I'm afraid. Uh, not much really at all. There are some red-billed buffalo weavers' nests up there. And the red-billed buffalo weavers are building. And Martin, you want to know a bit about the trees. And this one is a torchwood tree. This is a very magnificent tree. And you want to know what the most common tree in the Sabi Sands is. The most common tree is probably Combretum apiculatum. And that's sort of uh, on the granite soils. There are two, two kinds of soils in the Sabi Sands. You get granite soils and you get um, gabbro. And on the granite, granitic soils, which are the ones we're on now, the most common tree is something called the Combretum apiculatum or red bush willow. That's one of these things here. And it's actually, this is what the woodland that we drive through is named after. It's called Combretum apiculatum woodland or red bush willow woodland. Then there are another couple of uh, members of this genus, the Combretum genus, that are around. They're also pretty common. On the ridge crests, you get marulas, lots of marula trees, but they're only on the ridge crests. And then down sort of the mid slope, you'll get quite a few knob thorns and into the drainage line areas where the dry streams flow. We get quarry bushes and um, some of the bigger trees like the torchwoods and the jackalberries. But largely, we're looking at Combretum apiculatum or the red bush willow. There's the, you can see the buffalo weavers building their nest. You can also hear the woodland kingfisher going crazy. So these buffalo weavers are incredible builders of nests. And there's, a, there's an aerial outside the final control which they've taken over. And we basically can't clear it as fast as these birds build. Now, Bear in California, you've, made a, you've noticed quite a... Quite a profound truth, really. Um, you've noticed that the, the, the trees are green, but the grass is brown, and that's absolutely the case. And you notice it no better than when you're looking at it from the air. And it's getting worse and worse. Even the trees are starting to look a little bit wilted. And there you want to know that the animals will start to starve. Uh, yes, eventually the grazers will indeed start to get very hungry. I think rather than, we're not at the stage yet where they're about to start falling over and dying, um, but certainly the youngsters, the, you know, the, the, the impala ewes will struggle to produce sufficient milk now for their lambs, um, so that will weaken them and that will make things difficult for them and maybe they won't survive. Uh, I think what you will notice is a noticeable thinning of some of the animals. They'll start to just lose condition fairly soon. Apparently, the long-term weather report uh, is not very good. It says that it's going to be dry until February. Then we'll get a, probably a pretty normal rainfall for the year, uh, but it'll dump very quickly, which is not going to be good for the bush. Uh, it'll just create quite a lot of erosion. Um, I think predicting weather as far ahead as as February is basically like playing roulette. Uh, anyone can make those predictions, so you can probably do with some tarot cards and get a, just as a, an accurate a reflection of what the weather's going to be in February, but we'll see. It's all part of a completely natural, natural system, though. So, I mean, the system of drought and flood is completely normal for this area. And yes, it's not great for the animals, but we're certainly not going to run around um, feeding them because we're in an open system. If we were in a much smaller system where there were fences around the reserve and we actually act, had to actually do some management of animal numbers, then there'd be thoughts of feeding, pumping more water. But out here, we're going to try and let things just flow as naturally as possible, which will be a little unpleasant for some of the animals. I've no doubt, but it's completely normal. Right, let us move on. Oh, here's a nice red bull buffalo weaver. <laughs> Look at that.
Hello, Janet in Canada. You watched a documentary apparently a while back in the 80s um, where... I'm wondering if you're not referring to that. Uh, where Kudu were dying as a result of the tannin in their bellies uh, that they were getting from acacia trees. Now, <clears throat> you're absolutely right. Uh, plants will re respond to predation, to being preyed upon by herbivores, chemical uh, defense mechanisms, uh, is one thing. and in a time of drought, It isn't drought, the kudu. Sorry about that, it seems like the James has found a gremlin or three. Uh, we're still checking the south and western sections of Juma. Oh, looks like tracks of a big herd of buffalo across here. Maybe a big group of buffalo bulls. Still no sign of the queen. So if we get nothing in this area, we'll head further to the south. Apart from elephants, uh, and giraffe, and shit like that, are there any other animals that communicate ultrasonically? Um, dolphins, whales, definite ones. Uh, I think also there's a lot of uh, stuff we can't hear, uh, especially when it comes to like, something like a lion. I think there, there are some tones in a roar that we don't pick on. I don't know if we call that ultrasonic. Let me think about it for a few seconds, Valerie. What about bats? Bats, well done, Andrew. There we go. Uh, bats, definitely. <laughs> Cape turtle dove calling in the distance and I'm just imitating. Sorry about that, couldn't help myself. Cape turtle dove is one of those doves that uh, if you go on most safaris, at some point uh, your guide will <laughs> run out of ideas and use a very bad joke. And that is that in the morning the cape turtle said, says, work harder, work harder. And in the evening, Drink lager, drink lager. There's a couple of those that sort of uh, are, are stock standard to every, every guide in Africa. We don't try to use them too much. And if, you, if you've resorted to that, um, I think it's time to go back to your books, start reading and learning again. Disappointing. We do know the Queen Farula likes to zigzag through the bush rather than make life easy for us and walk down the road.
having a quick look at something in the book. Mm, always good to keep the books around. Andrew, you're going to have to do the spotting for me while I look for it quickly. Sudden part of a book searching is uh, because Genevieve uh, in New York would like to know when the African carrion flower will bloom. So she thinks they saw one once on Weaver's Nest. I have seen a couple, I can't remember exactly where, but I haven't seen any in bloom yet. And I can't off the top of my head remember when they do. Hoping it might not be in this book, that's the problem. Or it could be called something else. Could be called another name for it is, I if I remember, jackal, jackal food or jackal food plant. Okay. Uh, it is. What was that? Did you hear that, Andrew? Mm. That flower Genevieve is referring to, uh, hence one of its names, the carrion, the African carrion plant. It smells like decaying meat. I said, a jackal food, I think might is a relative of it. It might not be. And then one. Uh, Andrew has spotted some giraffe dung in the road to try help me not look so silly while searching through a book. Uh, so if it's, it could be a different, slightly different species, but it'll be under the same family. And uh, it is jackal food, uh, which is one of the carrion plants. And they are parasitic plants. So basically what happens is it exudes that smell like decaying flesh and keeps a little well and the different insects that are attracted to, to rotting flesh will go, be attracted and get caught and that plant will get its nutrients from digesting those. Uh, as it comes to when it blooms, I'm not 100% sure. And I did not bring the other flower book. So apologies, I'll have to find that out for you. Um, or if anyone can have a look, uh, have a look for me, have a double check, and remind me when the African carrion flower blooms. Spotted something else. There's a black belly bastard jogging away. Off it goes. <laughs> Look at that. A little bit of displaying. And there's no girls around to impress, Chief. Uh, there we go, look at that puffing up. Trying to look as impressive as possible. Well, maybe there's a lady to, to impress, we just haven't spotted her. As we did see very similar behavior once, not here, uh, of a male doing this when he spotted a lady and then displayed incredibly till he got close to her and then got shy. Not that feeling now, so probably no lady around. Probably just for our benefit. A 
And then on the other side up here, there is the Cape Turtle Dove and it's calling. Another little trick for the call is we did that work harder, but the other thing it could say is Cape Turtle, Cape Turtle. So it tells you his name. And of course now he's decided to stop calling and start preening. I like a lot of animals in the bush. Birds will carry quite a lot of ectoparasites, even ticks sometimes, but mostly they'll have mites. Okay, let's move on. So there's a few questions about what is that fluffy thing on my dashboard over here? And that and that are connected. We're busy doing a VR experiment at the moment. VR, virtual reality. So those cameras actually go 360 degrees around. And I think there's a, some strange form of helmet that you would put on your head and where you looked, you would be able to see what those cameras are seeing. But uh, it is a, still very much in the trial phase. And uh, I haven't seen any of the footage yet of you, Andrew. Negative. Negative. It's still going to go, once we finish filming, it's still going to go off to Johannesburg for the editors to try and figure out. And that, I think, is uh, way above Andrew and my sort of uh, pay grade. This morning actually feels like it's getting colder the longer we've been out. There's still a few little drops, Andrew is just cleaning them. Tiny little droplets of rain. Or well, rain's a strong word, but maybe, as you said, spitting. Right, while we continue on, let's go have a look at James, who's with one of our feathered friends. Hello chaps, um, there is a, a magpie shrike and just to the right of it, Tibbs, I don't know if you can see that, there's a squirrel sitting on the low, it's gone, don't worry about the squirrel, it's run away. So we're on the magpie shrike there, a flock of birds that uh, normally live together and in the background there we can hear um, a wood hoopoe calling. We had a question about the wood hoopoes earlier, all the way from New York and behind us I can hear a couple of them calling. There's the beautiful call of the magpie shrike. That... And they live as a flock, like I say, with an alpha pair that breeds, and the rest of them just helping raise the youngsters. I'd love to know why everybody thinks that they have long tails. Uh, it doesn't make a huge amount of flight sense, and often birds that have long tails, it's normally the males only that have sort of great, bright and um, unusual tail feathers. And in the magpie shrike, it's both, which is quite interesting. A very, very quiet morning out here at the moment. Um, we've seen about four bird species and um, that's pretty much it. I think I've seen one in parlor, uh, so not much in the way of mammals to go. Um, I might sort of start heading towards my, uh, my comfort zone of the hyena den fairly soon and see if we can't get a little bit of action there because there's no sign of the wild dogs, no sign of any lions or leopards or anything else. <coughs> ah, right, now Janet. I was answering your question about a drought and kudu and acacias and that sort of thing. And Janet, we may get black screen again here. I don't think we will, we should be right. Um, Janet, so just a quick summary. 
You watched a, a documentary about the drought in the 80s. It may have been in the 80s. Big drought around this area. Kudu dying because they were being poisoned by tannins. The tannins were produced by acacia trees. And yes, Janet, that does happen, of course. We know that acacia trees communicate by producing pheromones. So if one acacia tree is being eaten, um, it will increase the amount of tannin in its leaves and send out pheromones so that acacia trees in the immediate vicinity also increase their tannin levels. Now, what you will notice if you watch kudu or if you watch giraffe grazing or browsing is that they will eat in a patch of trees and then move quite far to eat, uh, as I say that, look at that on cue, appearing from center left, stage left, sorry, is a giraffe. some very thick bush unfortunately but we can just have a quick look there there's also a zebra's fairly large bottom sticking through the bush there i'm not going to drive off road for that giraffe because it is quite a long way off so what the, what the acacias do is that they will increase the amount of tannins that there are so you watch that giraffe eating It'll eat around a patch for a while and then it'll move on to another patch fairly distant from that or onto a different species because the, the trees apparently don't tend to talk to each other between the species. Now what tannin does, of course, in the belly is that it stops up the gut. So uh, it's just, just like um, the old wi wives' tale where you... Uh, if you've got a, well, it's not an old wives' tale, it's a home remedy. If you've got a sore tummy or you're feeling a bit nauseous, you drink black tea. And that black tea, oh, that's a much better looking giraffe. That black tea has the same effect. It's the tannin in the black tea that will calm your stomach. Now, if you have too much of that tannin, eventually what it does is it stops up the gut entirely. And then if there's a drought and you, you know, animals like kudu have got limited options as to where to go and eat, that tannin can eventually result in death. So yes, thank you, Janet. Brilliant question. And let's hope it doesn't get quite as bad as that 80s drought. But I remember people were getting very depressed about it when I was just a little boy. Penny Pine, um, you've asked a question about ultrasonic communication. Now, I'm not sure that you mean ultrasonic. I think you might mean infrasonic. Ultra means above, infra means below. So ultrasonic communication, birds that we have, or animals that we have here that communicate ultrasonically would be only the bats. They're the only ones that I know of that can communicate ultrasonically. Perhaps some of the birds can make sounds that are too high for us to hear, but I think it's largely just the bats. Then we're looking at giraffe, of course, and they make ultrasonic sounds. So sounds too low for the human ear to hear. And, sorry, infrasonic sounds. And that's the same as elephants. And Penny, you want to know if I think that they can hear these sounds between species. So interspecific um, sort of ultrasonic, uh, infrasonic communication. Um, Penny, I imagine they could. You know, we can hear within our hearing range just because um, animals are not making sounds specifically for our understanding we can certainly hear them uh, because our ears are designed for such so if you're an elephant or a giraffe and you're designed to hear infrasound i've no doubt that you can hear um sorry i'm just looking at some flickering in the bush there i think it's a diker it is a diker i thought maybe it was a large predator instead it is a meek and mild humble diker just through here i'm going to roll forward mainly because it's not running away which is unusual so penny i think if you've got the equipment to hear infrasound while you might not understand the sounds being given um, you will definitely be able to hear them there he is tebs can you see him of course tebs can see him tebs can teb Tebs can spot a, a leopard at 500 paces. So there is the common diker.
<laughs> Thank you, Trent, in Fiji, for your question, and it's such a good one. And one that I wondered about until very recently. Why, says Trent, are some antelope like giraffe, uh, not giraffe, like impala, and steenbok, why are they bright red in colour when they live in a green environment? Because it makes them look obvious. For years and years, Trent, I wondered exactly the same thing, uh, especially when people tried to tell me, especially in my junior biology classes, how clever the camouflage of these animals was. And I kept looking at things like the parlour thinking, that ain't camouflaged at all. It's extremely obvious. Um, Trent, it would seem to have to do with the shades of colour that their major predators are able to see in. Now, while they don't see in colour, they don't see in black and white either. They see more in shades of red and green. Now, apparently, if you take a... If you, take a, um, if you can only see in red and green, because of the, the way those, I think those two light frequencies, and anybody is welcome to come and correct me on this, but because of the way those two light frequencies um, or color frequencies meld together, if you are a, co a colorblind predator out here, that red color is actually a really good disguise in the green bush or the green bush as a background. So it's got to, largely to do, Trent, with the fact that our eyes are very different from the major predators of those sort of chestnut red animals. Great question. And uh, it seems to have passed the notice of countless people as they've been out here on safari because, and a bit like a zebra, a zebra too, to our eyes, is uh, extremely obvious. You can spot a zebra far more easily than you can spot a dica like that. That dica's color is perfect, I think. Brownish gray, even grayer than that. If I was to, if I was to try and if I was to try and disguise myself out here, I would be somewhere between the colour of that diker and an elephant's colour. I wouldn't be wearing khaki. I wouldn't be wearing camouflage, mainly because camouflage, I think, should only be worn by people in the military. It seems otherwise looks pretty ridiculous. And grey. You are looking for a kind of uniform to wear out here. A pale grey, green, brown is the kind of thing you want to go for. Just trying to look at the Tibbs's, Tibbs's clothing. Tibbs is wearing sort of a, a black shirt with, um, with a, with a grey tiger on it, and the grey tiger would be very hidden. The black, however, out here is pretty obvious. So this colour that I'm wearing here would be pretty obvious if you were walking through here. Nice question. Thank you, Trent. Brilliant. GJ, um, <laughs> you, you want to know if that was a, a diker or a unicorn? Um, GJ, uh, unicorns uh, are only occur in the southern Kruger National Park. Uh, we get large herds of unicorns there. Um, and generally, their major predator, of course, are the dragons of the Kruger National Park. But again, you've got to go further south to see them. Uh, it's actually quite a good question. They, they look like they look like unicorns because of that little tuft of hair that they have on them, and it's a female diker. And I think that tuft of hair, a little bit like a warthog uh, youngster's the little crest, family of crested Franklins. Those ones are young. Like this from this year. So, Gigi, I think that, that little tuft that sticks up is um, just like a warthog piglets when they're born. They've got those sort of white hairs that stick out of their mouths that look a little bit like tusks. I think instead of investing in horns, um, they basically just got a, a, a just, it's, it's not a horn. It's just a tuft of hair, and I think it's there as a disguise almost. It's, it's, it's there to convince potential enemies that they've got something spiky up there that might be a bit dangerous. So I think it's there to deter enemies. In the same way that before a warthog's tusks grow, they've got white hair that looks like tusks. I think it might simply be a case of a, like the crown on the head of your hair, where, you know, this is where the hair comes together. Red 
Mockingbird. I don't believe I've heard from you before. Um, so this is your first time talking to us. Welcome. And um, if it isn't, um, I'm sorry for my uh, tardy memory. Uh, Red Mockingbird, uh, you want to know about the pre-orbital gland and what it is? Um, I should have stopped for longer with that dica. Sorry, well, it went into the bush. They've got a gland just below the eye. And pre in means in front. And so pre-orbital, orbital is the eye socket. Pre-orbital, a gland just in front of the eye here. And you can see it on the dike here. You can see it on the steering book as well if you get a good view of them. And they use that gland to mark territory on sticks. So they'll go up to a stick and it almost looks like they're about to spike their eyes out. But they go and they rub that gland on the stick and that leaves a scent for other, that other dikers can smell. Right, we're getting into the thick bush now. Heading towards the Mlulwati drainage line, a great torrent of water. Actually, more a dry stream. Marla, I'm afraid I cannot answer your question, but it's a good one. What, I think it's what your question was, what predators see the most shades of green? I, I really don't know. Um, I would imagine that the, di the diurnal ones, like the cheetah and the wild dogs, probably have a greater um, sort of color vision than the nocturnal ones. So maybe wild dogs or, or cheetah. So if you try to hide from a wild dog, you best be either totally invisible or very fast. Because wild dogs um, are not stalkers, of course, they will just chase you. Well, not you, hopefully. You're just 13 years old and you want to know the difference between a diker and a steenbok. Well, a diker is actually a bit larger, probably weighs about 17 kilograms, and you can multiply that by 2.2 to get the pounds. So, about 40 pounds, 40 to 45 pounds, the female. Uh, she's a bit bigger. And the steenbok is smaller, so only about 11 kilograms, uh, about 28 pounds or so. So that's the major difference. And the Stiernbok is a nice, rich, red chestnut color, which is very lovely. And the diker is that kind of browny gray. And the diker, the further towards the Cape of South Africa that you go, the grayer they go. So down in the Cape, they're totally gray. And up here, they tend to be a little browner than they would be normally. Ooh, wee. There is a beautiful, beautiful bird. And I'm just going to stop here. Tibbs, if you look past this dead tree on the left, there's a tree well behind it, and there's a bird in the sort of top of it there. And I think it's a European golden oriole. It is. But unless, unless you've seen it fly in there, I'm not sure Tibbs is going to be able to get it. Tibbs, can you see what I mean? I don't see it. Okay, so you see this you see this dead tree here on the left. Yeah. You go just to the left of that, straight over the top of the bush in front, and onto the tall tree that's sitting on the bank of the drainage line. Right on the top of that tree, there is a European there it just moved. There it's flown away. I don't know if you saw it. Unless I just happened to spot it as it was flying along. But I just want to show you it's one of the most beautiful birds that you can see. We, the most common one we see is, of course, the black-headed oriole, and we see them all over the place and all the time. But just look at the color on that bird. Isn't that stunning? And it really is that big, at least that bright yellow gold. It's just so stunning. And the way I spotted it from where I was sitting is that the wings are very, very black, so it looks like a kind of... Um, you don't initially see the wings, you just see this kind of uh, arrow of gold flying through the bush. 
beautiful. This one's even better, but he's even, he's quite rare. That's the African Golden Oriole. Mm. Beautiful. Sorry about that. We very seldom will get the opportunity to see them on camera. They tend to be a, quite secretive. I was really hoping that that might be our time. I think definitely time to head over to the hyena den and see what we can see. Claire in New York, I'm not sure if you're testing me, if you're asking a question. Um, either way, I'm going to fail you. Um, you say that there's a term for the bicolor, the, or the two colors that Impala have, and you want to know what that term is. Uh, Claire, I don't know what that term is. I didn't know there was a special term for that um, sort of stripe they have across the bed. They're also a different color on the belly compared to the flank. Keeping an eye out for my Oriole friend here. I don't Sorry, Claire in New York, I think we lost a bit of a um, signal there. So you say that there is a term for the bicolor of impalas, the different colors that they have, and that stripe that goes down their flanks, um, and you want to know what it is. Claire, I don't know what it is, I'm afraid. So I'll have to try and find out for you, but I don't know what it is. Smell some elephants. I can see evidence of elephants on the road. Some tracks you can see. You can see their tracks moving. Unfortunately, they're going the other way. Uh, probably we're right on the southern boundary now. We're quite close to the southern boundary, so I suspect they've probably walked out. And uh, Rusty doesn't have signal there anyway, so we're not going to try and head down there. You say you love the hyena den and you're just learning to use Twitter. Good for you. I'm sure you'll become very skilled at it very soon if you're just 10. Well, we're going to go to the hyena den now um, and hopefully there'll be some little babies there and you'll enjoy them. Um, we're going to hand over to Brent now because we have to change the battery on this camera. So as soon as Jerry, who's on um, the microphone this morning, can tell Brent that we need to go across to him, we'll go across to Brent and then we'll change the battery on the camera and see you later at the Hyena Den. All right, Brent is ready for you. See you later. So, welcome back. No luck on any leopard tracks just yet. There is a little bit more moisture in the air, so Andrew's just giving the lens a quick wipe. Oh, hello, hello. Young male kudu. In certain parts of South Africa, nicknamed the Grey Ghost. For every one you see, there's a few you might not.
disappearing into the bushes. have a rematch because I cut Andrew off. As I explained, I was so far ahead of him that I just changed lanes to, to show I was overtaking. But uh, maybe we will have a rematch. Let's see. Let's see if we can find some animals first before we, we get desperate enough to, to race down the road again. There you go. Impala and Waterbuck. for a second guys, I thought I heard an alarm call. Just, just a single snort. Could be that Impala picked up the scent of something it didn't like. Nice male water buck at the back there. A water buck. And the reason for this is in the south, uh, where the first warden's house was, his name was Harry Kirkman. Uh, there were an incredible amount of water buck around his that area he used to live. So he decided it would be a good emblem. Look there, Andrew. And I think that Impala was confused because there's kudu in this area and vervet monkeys. They're both expert leopard spotters. So I think it might have just been snorting out a bit of scent. Always look guilty, vervet monkeys. Well, let's carry on, let's see if we can get a, a better view of that monkey. since Big Cat Week. Well, thanks for watching. And we'd like to know if, is it? What is it? What is it's it? holding his foot, I think. It's holding its foot. I thought it was a female with a baby, but he's just holding its foot. Maybe he's got a thorn. <laughs> uh, but Christy, uh, there are baboons in the, in the Sabi Sands. Uh, they are more common closer to the permanent water holes. Uh, and permanent river systems. So up here in the north, we don't have that ma many big rivers and they like big African ebony trees to roost in. And we got a bit of aloe grooming by those vervet monkeys there. So I'm just listening to the radio quickly. Okay, so an update from the east of us. 
and and yes, two Birmingham boys and one in Kuruma Lioness and the rest of the pride headed east into the Kruger National Park. Uh, unfortunately, I do not know whether Junior was with them. I will try to find out later. Well, he's going to try to do it very quickly, but with this... Oh, I need to get this guy. Maybe we can... Oh, it's on the side. Oh. Putting it, you're going to break it. The lock mechanism is on. Oh, I can't. This is different from the other tripod. Ah, oh, he was too fast for me today. Uh, trying to operate. Oh, right in front. Oh, I'm so silly. Um, but we're just taking that... So we're just going to protect that. That doesn't have any waterproofing or anything. So we're going to take it off. I don't think there's enough rain to even think about abandoning the safari just yet. But uh, obviously with sensitive equipment, water isn't great for it. We'll pop that in there as well. Tiny little droplets. So it's probably Tingana as the leopards go and the Birmingham boys as the lions go. to Raisa in Finland, uh, who's let me know when the carrion flower was blooming. It was blooming in March. So we'll definitely have to keep a smell out for it. And if we smell rotting, uh, rotting flesh in the same place, there could be a carrion flower around. So 
we saw a wonderful bird running around a bit earlier, uh, and Jared and Getz Gecko would like me to clarify the name. Uh, the name is a black-bellied bustard. A black-bellied bustard. What is Andrew spotted? I just saw a hand fling up from me. What have you got, Andrew? Oh, Gerald. Gerald. it's Gerald. There you go, male giraffe. Here we go, feeding off an acacia. And the camel leopard. James mentioned earlier, those acacia species there uh, are able to communicate with other acacias of the same species when it has been fed on for too long by a giraffe or kudu. And they release a chemical into the air that triggers all the other acacias in the area to increase their tannins, making the leaves very bitter and forcing the herbivore to move on. So acacias have large thorns to protect them from certain types of animals feeding, uh, but with giraffe and elephant and other animals that are impervious to those thorns, it has now developed a chemical response uh, to keep keep them from being overfed. It's amazing how entire these, the, everything sort of fits in so well out in the ecosystem. Now we're going to leave Gerald to his breakfast and uh, see if we can follow up on those lion tracks. Safari Live, welcome to Audrey, who's 12 years old. Uh, Audrey is wondering, do we have any hippopotamus here? We do, Audrey. We are going through a drought at the moment. So a lot of the places where hippo would have been, like that dried up water hole we just went past, are now devoid of hippos. Uh, but uh, the Arethusa water hole still got some in. So we do have hippos and crocodiles, just not currently on Juma. Very pretty little antelope. Oh, let the Nyala move on. So back to Super Nikki's question. So it's about an 8 million acre unfenced area. Uh, that animals are free to travel through. Uh, the majority of made, is made up of the Kruger National Park, which is obviously a national park. And 
then on the peripheries of the park, uh, you have these private reserves. We're in the Sabi Sands private game reserves. And there's a few more uh, that also are open to the Kruger National Park. So there's no fences between the national park and the private land. And animals are able to migrate and move between the areas. And then if we go down even smaller, we're in the northern Sabi Sands. And we operate on two properties uh, called the Juma Private Game Reserve and Arathusa Private Game Reserve. eastern part of South Africa, uh, on the border of our provinces. Sorry, this is not so uh, uh, Just an elephant dragging its feet. Uh, and we're on the border of Mpumalanga province uh, and Limpopo province. Uh, Limpopo province is obviously named after the Limpopo River. We've ever read Rudyard Kipling's Just So Stories. Well, no, the Limpopo River is where the elephant got its long trunk. Uh, on the banks of the great grey, green, greasy Limpopo, all beset with fever trees. And in Pumalanga, which we are currently driving in now, uh, means the place of the rising sun, so it is the eastern province of South Africa. That hollow there is where the new brown-headed parrot nest is. I think if we look carefully in one of these uh, that has fallen down, we might see where the old nest was. Not this one. No, there it is. So there's the old nest. Obviously, when picking up dead branches and wood in the bush, one must be cautious and 
Oh, and this is one of the reasons why I'm going to bring it to Andrew. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. My morning exercise, running yesterday, weightlifting today. Can you see in there? Can you see the spider? Yes. Can, shall I bring it a little bit closer? That's perfect there. Perfect there, okay. I'll try hold it still. Now that is one of the most venomous spiders we get here. It is called a violin spider, and it has a cytotoxic venom, which is cell-destroying venom. And if it bites you, it causes basically incredible necrosis. So the cells die around that side and can actually form craters. I lean forward a bit, is that better? To see yeah. the spider. Is it just on the bottom right there? It's right in the center. <laughs> Oh, yeah. There we go. So there we go. There's the violin spider. Not something you want to be bitten by. And it is a, quite a common spider uh, around pieces of dead wood like this. And the other things that like to live in pieces of dead wood like this, especially a nice big hollow one like this, would be snakes and scorpions. There we go. That is one of the most venomous spiders we get out here in the bush. Uh, not something you would want to be bitten by, but still a very important part of the ecosystem. Oh, there we go. Oh. Off we continue. It's not always about the big hairies and scaries. Sometimes it's about the little spindlies and scary. search of a big, hairy, and scary at the moment. Uh, one of the large Birmingham male lions. Uh, fingers crossed he has come visiting Juma. No tracks just yet. Hags on YouTube would like to know, is that the same as a recluse spider? No, a, re a recluse spider is a, a button spider or a widow. So not a recluse. Uh, they have a much bigger, uh, fatter body, and they always have a red hourglass on their abdomen. But uh, we can chat a little bit more about the venomous spiders a bit later. Let's go have a look at uh, James's uh, closest friends in the bush. Smith, Leo Smith. My closest friends, perhaps not. My closest relatives, yes, indeed. And um, mm. indeed, Brent's closest relatives, too. Our, all of our closest relatives living out here. The Circopathene apes or monkeys. And that's what these are. The vervet monkey. And I'm just sitting looking at that thing on the dead tree, wondering how on earth it can find it comfortable to basically sit on a spike. If you look carefully at it, I mean, it really is perched on a particularly precarious and uncomfortable-looking piece of branch. But there he sits, completely relaxed, enjoying the view, watching us as intently as we're watching him. There we go. Now that, of course, is far more elegant than the tree climbing I managed to achieve yesterday. And that's because, of course, the power to weight ratio on something like that monkey is much more impressive than it is on a human being. And I always use the example of if, you can, if you've ever met a human being who's able to do a one-armed pull-up. So, I mean, there are quite a few people who can, cannot do any kind of pull-up at all. But a one-armed pull-up is truly impressive. And a monkey, of course, can do hundreds of them. Likewise, a baboon. So, I mean, their power-to-weight ratio 
is quite astonishing. They really are very, very strong for the size that they are. Sitting in the marula tree, possibly hoping it's going to start fruiting soon. There, let's head on. They're over there. Zoe, you're on Twitter, and you, <laughs> you want to know if I've got any cuts and bruises from my tree climbing expedition yesterday. Look, Zoe, I've got a very bad injury there on my wrist. It's very severe. Very severe. Nobody's offered me any kind of help. It was so sore. It was very, very painful, Zoe. Right, on we go. I must say, it is quite, it feels, sometimes you drive out in the morning and you have the sense of expectancy, like something exciting is going to happen around every corner. And sometimes you drive out in the morning and the energy you feel is completely different. This is one of those days when it just feels like the bush is still fast asleep. Certainly that would be borne out by the number of um, large game sightings that we've had. We went to the hyena den, by the way, nothing there. Well, there was one, one adult lying under some shade. We saw one of her ears. Uh, it was a very impressive ear, but not necessarily the best TV. I think the trick with that hyena den is to get there very early, sort of at first light. And then again, just as it gets dark. some sort of crackle on my microphone. We'll try and sort that out while we're doing that. Let's head across to Brent. Welcome back. Uh, James is going to try to fix those gremlins quickly. We'll be back with them a little later. So we're still perusing the eastern boundary. Unfortunately, no luck just yet. Your memory 
those leopard traps crossed here and we found them down there and I remember correctly that art fog then should be in there. Hopefully the bush isn't too thick to get there. Okay, let's go have a look. That is the one animal I'm very excited to possibly one day be able to catch on the live drives. Unfortunately though, uh, they generally only really get moving after 10 o'clock at night. Uh, and this is to avoid the peak times of the predators. So your predators' peak times are around morning yeah. oh, around sunset and sunrise so you find quite a lot of your small and more interesting nocturnal mammals are only active uh, sort of after that late in the night you're gonna have to go a loop a loop a bit to get there so you can see the sand of the den there the problem is when approaching hard fog dens uh, not on foot uh, it can cause you to sink into a hole of course we do not want. Dig ourselves out. Here we go. Uh, Andrew actually fell in one while walking. He's the only person I know to have done that. He actually managed to injure himself slightly. Side. I'm just going to jump out. There are multiple burrow entrances. So all around there's actually one here. You always got to be careful because sometimes uh, they shared with uh, warthogs, which come to, tend to come barreling out of these holes at high speed. And this one looks like it is actually being used by warthog at the moment by the tracks. Uh, and a warthog coming through at about 60 k's an hour would definitely be an uncomfortable experience for my shins but over here over here is the one that's used by the art park at the moment ah oh, so incredible i really want to get a trail camera and pop it up here the art park's been lying at the burrow uh, i'm just trying to see if i can get a car a bit closer because we've got a perfect imprint of the art park here where he's been lying and his tail. Can you see it, Andrew? It's a bit difficult. Yes, you can. So this art fox has been lying facing towards the burrow. And and you can there's the, the holes down there. But you can see its big fat tails here. And the art fox is actually quite a big animal. This is really fresh. There's some really fresh urine at the entrance of the, dam, uh, of the den. And multiple holes being used. So one of these days we're going to catch one on a sunset safari. Sometimes on cool days like this, they might come out into the open. But I think this one has been, they've been down for a while. But definitely something to keep an eye on. Very active art park den. And Warthog also utilizing one of the other holes. Now, it's not uncommon. Artfark are the excavators of the bush. So, all the different animals that live in holes and termite mounds in the ground hyenas, wild dog, uh, porcupine, warthogs all benefit from the Artfark digging prowess. Houston uh, would like to know would an art fox be a predator because it eats uh, it eats termites and ants uh, no it would not it would be an insectivore but in the 
definition of the word predator, I suppose you could say it is possibly a predator, uh, but generally uh, predators eat meat. So it's not far from the road, definitely something worth checking every now and then. here in the bush a bit earlier at the violin spider and Siberia would like to know if I had an insect collection while I was young she says she used to collect insects and spiders in a terrarium I had a massive insect collection when I was younger uh, and a collection of pretty much anything you could pick up in the bush uh, so it was my laundry was quite a, quite a scary feat for whoever was doing it because my pockets were generally filled with exoskeletons, bones, bits of beak, smelly things or whatever I could find. Let's keep going, see what's there. Unfortunately, we are getting towards the end of the eastern boundary with no sign of those lion tracks. Terranium and collected insects and spiders. Uh, I'm gonna guess he didn't. I think he didn't, but maybe I'm wrong. So while we're down here, Judy in South 
sunny California. Judy would like to know when do the migratory bird species like woodlands, kingfishers, palmine, bee eaters, European rollers, and all the cuckoos uh, depart for warmer climes as our winter comes along. Uh, Judy, as early, some of them as early as March, but most of them sort of March, May. spotted two squirrels on a termite mound. If that termite mound is active, it's possible they're sitting next to it for heat. Mm, but I don't think those ones are sitting there for heat. I think they just happen to be moving around in there. Went to some high ground. There you go, a tree squirrel. Two of them. Jump. One off the other side. So I think they've been foraging on the ground, maybe for marula nuts and that, and they probably heard our vehicle coming and that was the closest high ground to them. Funny little chaps. They said we're nearly at that. across quickly to James to another feathered friend while we make our way towards the Hornwell's nest. Hi everybody, hold on to your stomachs, this might be a bit rough. We're looking at a Mariko sunbird there, beautiful bird, but really is leaping about the place. And so Teb is going to have to be very quick on the camera. And ooh, that's it, I think. It's gone into a marula tree just to the left there. One of the two most common sunbirds we get here, Mariko and white-bellied. And we also get the collared, which is much smaller. Beautiful bird, that Mariko sunbird. Lots of different colors on it, and I'll show you a picture of it. Unfortunately, it's disappeared. But all around here, there's a little bit of a bird party going on. You can hear quite a lot of calling. Um, just some small birds. There's some, uh, um, some canaries. There's a long-billed crombeck. There's an apalus. Right, Mariko sunbird is here. There. Look at him there. That's what we were looking at. And I don't know what kind of a view you got, but that's basically what he looks like. Beautiful, beautiful iridescent colors. Pretty, huh? Right, we're just near Treehouse Dam. Well, I've no doubt there'll be a great plethora of animals waiting for us. I also want to just try and show you that canary if we can find him. Just see if we can't spot the canary again. It seem that the canary has flown away. All right, let's go back to Brent. Apparently he has something that's landed on his car. Hopefully not a leopard. We'll see you shortly. So as we linked across to James, I noticed this beetle running on the ground and we managed to catch him. Very, very pretty. It's called a cotton stainer and it feeds off wild cotton and, and a big problem in commercial cotton crops uh, and they actually destroy the the crop. Oops, there we go. Oh, it looks like he's going to try escape off the other side of the vehicle. A very pretty little bug. about to leap off the side of the vehicle. Some baby Cokie Franklins. 
almost more like sub adults now. Okay. Yeah. See the head popping up, up a bit around the base. And go backwards a little bit. I don't think they're going to come up the front. And see how it's almost creeping up a bit and to the left. Uh -huh. See how they creep, Koki Franklin's? Oh, he's gone behind the termite mount. They actually almost put their you know, back a bit. This one, there we go. Baby one just popped up. We'll just try and maybe, oh, I think back is going to be the best. So Koki Franklin's quite a shy and retiring Franklin species sometimes. And they actually sort of put their body almost vertical and creep through the ground, so, uh, creep close to the ground. And they've done a ducker. Uh, so they're not noticed, but a call we hear quite often, uh, quite, and sometimes described as a, sounds like a rusty bed spring. I've done the disappearing act, uh, but we are still on our way to that hornbill nest, which is just around the corner. Were you with me when we found this nest, Andrew? I snake track and judging from the size of that and the movement of it I would say that is a very big black mamba track incredible and it's going to moved across the northern boundary uh, but a very very warm welcome to Nathan He's in Florida. He's watching for the first time. Welcome to Safari Live, Nathan. Also, uh, he says we've got very different wildlife in Florida. And also, Tammy and Tracy in Canada, watching for the first time with an old-time viewer. That's incredible. Bash. Okay. So we're about to find that hornbill nest. Well, if it's still a nest, if it's not just a hollow in the tree. And the reason I found it is I actually saw a, a, the male red bull hornbill with a large grasshopper in its mouth fly and stop. So it is in this African ebony tree here. Yeah? Sometimes we can just make out the female inside. And she still is inside, it hasn't been opened yet. So Andrew, can you spot the nest? Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see if Andrew knows what a hornbull's nest looks like. So Andrew, look, why don't you guys look with Andrew, see who's gonna be the first to spot the nest. I'm gonna give you a hint, Andrew, it's further down the trunk than that, uh, the way. Other way down. Oh, no, no, you're right way down, sorry. Thank you. Lighten up a bit. Go up a little bit. No, to the left. And lighten. Zoom. What, what are you doing, Andrew? Well, my, which way must I go? Zoom in. Up or down, or left or right. Keep where you are. Keep zooming. And go down a little bit. Up a little bit. There uh -huh. we go. So, the hornbills will actually encase mud and close the hole while the female's on the eggs. Uh, unfortunately, she's not popping her beak out just yet. So she's still inside there. She'll actually lose all her feathers while she's in that nest. And that will give the nice warm area for the babies. And the male's sole job during this time period is to feed her. There you go. And we've got it. And, and so he will be out foraging just for food for her and he'll feed her through that little hole. 
And now I've got a beetle I don't know, so I'm going to have to go do some research when I get home. And just landed on my hand. Looks like it's possibly related to ladybugs, but I'm going to have to have a, a better look when I get home. Very ticklish crawling over my skin. Uh, I'm just having a look at the face. Yeah, I think it is poss poss probably related to ladybugs. So if it is, we should make a wish and blow it off. Oh, or it can take off by itself and deprive me of my wish. So we'll keep checking this hornbill nest sometime. Hopefully we'll get lucky and we might see the male feeding the female. Time to put you to the test again. Now let's see if I can find it first. Okay, so I'm checking very carefully on the ground here. Um, I saw a butterfly land there uh, and it's in terms of names of butterflies, it's my favorite. I can't see it at the moment, Andrew. I'm just looking. Its name is a wandering donkey. It's a member of the Acrea family. Very pretty butterflies. The wandering donkey isn't the prettiest of the Acreas, but... Let me see if I can... Oh, it landed on this little bush. No, there it goes. Oh, I went the wrong way. Sorry about that. Uh, can't really control which way a butterfly flies. But, uh, we'll try finding another one. I've got a new secret spot for butterflies. So we definitely uh, either nature on this sunrise safari or on the sunset safari. We will be doing a segment on butterflies. We're trying to see how many butterflies we can catch on camera uh, during this wet season that's not very wet. Uh, we have a request from Matt in sunny Florida to try to find a grey hooded kingfisher. Sorry, Mike, not Matt. Um, we will definitely try. I might, I know where they are nesting, so I might swing past the nest a little later. So quickly across to James, he's keeping that bird that's ticking this morning. Everybody, this is a very interesting bird. What I want you to do, Tips, if you can get in very close on the head and try and look at the gape, which is basically the lips, and look where they extend to. You can see they extend behind the middle of the eye. You can also see that little sort of beige cap that he's got on the back of his head. Now, I'm not going to tell you what he is, so let's try and diagnose him together. He's a big eagle roughly sort of two feet tall and just look at that gape is very diagnostic so tell us what you think this is it's not a bird we see often at all it's one of the largest eagles but interestingly is not sort of one of the most voracious predators so tell us what you think that is Hashtag Safari Live, questions at wildearth.tv. And I'm going to spend a bit of time with him because it really is very special to see this bird. I'll try and just find out exactly how big he is for you. But he's much bigger than a Wahlberg's eagle. So he's not a Wahlberg's eagle. I suppose another clue would be that he comes from the same place as um, our main tech guru. 
um, which of course is up around Russia. So he's actually two and a half feet tall. Don't fly, bird. Uh, no, not flying. Just going to have his morning, his morning constitutional. He's a magnificent fellow, and you don't see them this often. You don't see them sitting this sort of confidingly. And look at those enormous claws, which are not actually normally used too much. He will eat small, small um, mammals and that sort of thing, but he's largely a termite eater, certainly out here anyway. So he's here from Russia and will spend the summer here and then go back home. Does not breed in this country. He breeds in Mother Russia. If you're still wondering what he's called, he's named after a particular vegetation type. You can see a very nice, the yellow sear that he has, which is a little piece of skin on which his nostrils sit. That's called a sear. Mm. I haven't seen an example of a bird like, of this bird sitting like this for many years. He's been really very good to us. Right, we've got two incorrect answers and one correct one. Uh, Margaret, you say a verose eagle or black eagle? No, um, too small and not quite black enough. And James, you've got the correct answer. Well, of course you do with a name like that. How could you possibly be wrong? And then there was also a guess that it was a fish eagle. It is not a fish eagle. A fish eagle looks exactly like an American bald eagle, uh, just a bit smaller, with a white head and black and brown feathers. This is, James, as you say, a step eagle. Beautiful bird all the way from Russia, largely eats termites, like I say, doesn't breed here. And that's a two and a half foot bird, so it's huge. And you'd expect it to be a voracious predator of small mammals, maybe taking out the odd small impala. But no, it eats largely insects and it's actually got a clever strategy. Low risk, you obviously don't get injured eating termites unless you're particularly stupid. And hugely full of energy and protein and all sorts of other good things. But also, oh, look at him go. Gee whiz, it's a big bird. Wow. <laughs> now, the other thing they will also do is raid nests. They'll raid quelia bird nests, and quelias uh, nest in huge clouds, uh, or they flock in huge clouds, and they nest in amongst the knobthorn trees on gabbro clearings. And they will also, um, sort of, uh, I'm just turning the radio down, they will also raid those colonies of quelia birds. Now, Jenny on Twitter, look at these little chin spot battises that have landed here. No, sorry, not chin spot battises at all, they're white crowned helmet shrikes. We'll just have a look into this into this tree while I try and oh, there they go. While we watch them fly away. Jenny, you want to know if they can those step eagles can break open termite mounds. Jenny, no, they don't break open termite mounds. Look at these little things. What are those? Tiny little birds in the tree here. They're also sunbirds. I think they're white-bellied sunbirds. Obviously, almost impossible to, to film. Oh, there we go, Tibbs. You'll get them now. Same tree that the step eagle was in. Um, Jenny, they can't break open um, termite mounds. They feed on the alates. That's a Marika sunbird. It's the same bird we were looking at earlier. Beautiful. Two of them in this tree. So 
I believe you haven't quite seen it yet because he is really difficult to film. There, Tebsky, have you got him? No. Just no. above us here. Straight above us. Got him, Tebs. It's too tiny, it's not as visible to the camera. Okay, it might be a bit difficult. Might be a bit difficult to see. There, you can see them calling now. <laughs> Very difficult. I believe you saw one falling through the screen. They're tiny little things. They're size of sort of large bumblebees. So uh, not very difficult to film. Anyway, that's the Mariko sunbird. Um, and the step eagle is not a sort of miner in the termite mounds. What they do is that they will wait for the alates to come out or they'll walk around the ground where the harvest of termites are especially on a day like this, where the harvest of termites will come out because there's no sun at the moment, and they'll do their work that they would often do at night, and then the step eagle will walk around and just pick them off the ground. Lots of birds going on, most of them moving far too fast to try and catch with the camera. The tracks here. Now we were looking at the step eagle, which is one of the largest eagles we get here. But the most common brown eagle we get here is called the tawny eagle. And Tanner, you know that. And you want to know if they will eat small mammals like impala. And well, we're just going to stop here and Tibbs will. Track. I think it's probably that step eagle that's flying above us there. Um, Tanner, tawny eagles won't kill small impala. Highly unlikely, they're not really big enough. Um, the only eagles in this particular area that are big enough to catch a tawny eagle, at least to catch a baby impala, would be a martial eagle. They're the biggest eagles that we get here. That's him, that's the same step eagle we've just watched. Vast, vast bird. And it's just starting to warm up a bit. You can see the cloud breaking slightly. And what that means is that the earth is starting to warm up. And the warming of the earth is starting to create thermals. And the big bird like that needs thermals to fly without too much energy. And this magnificent kind of camera that we have here I'll show you the different, you almost look like fingers on the edges of those wings. And it just amazes me, you watch how subtly or how steady he is. His tail is moving all the time, making very slight adjustments just to make sure that he's able to maintain that steady flight. I just love the picture of them juxtaposed against that gunmetal grey sky. Mm. You know, so often they're sawing or soaring. Well, um, it moves so far away from the camera, up and over the top, and this is just perfect. Not common at all. You can see the bits of white on his back. It's also fairly diagnostic. And I think Brent saw the other interesting brown eagle that we get here at this time of the year called the lesser spotted eagle. He saw that yesterday. See the tail switching from side to side as he turns. Isn't that amazing? You can hear a few of the birds calling around us now. A couple of chin spot battises. <whistles> Your 
about lark, rattling sisticulars. As you say, Jenny, you'd like to see a martial eagle. Live, beautiful birds, they are indeed, Jenny. Um, very, they're not common simply because they have enormous territories and they're quite territorial. Uh, but yes, we could certainly try and see one. It would be wonderful to see one flying like the step eagles flying. Now, Tibbs, before you come back to me, there's a white-backed vulture flying and he's obviously seen or perceived or somehow figured out that that step eagle is on a thermal and the white backed vulture will now try and catch the same thermal. There he goes. The vulture is a very heavy bird. Look at him taking off there on the same thermal. And the thermal, in case you're wondering, is a, is a shaft of hot light, uh, air that rises up from the ground. There's another vulture coming into it from the side. Uh, it's not a vulture, that's a batelier. You see the batelier, Tibbs, to the far, it's just the one to the far right now, banking left. It's incredible to have them all in shot like this. The batelier, of course, won't use the thermal so much. They don't need to, much less drag. So he's pulled out of the thermal and moved away. The step eagle is still circling in the same thermal and the vulture is trying desperately to gain a bit of height. They're very heavy. And I don't think this is a particularly strong thermal. That vulture is really struggling to get up, flapping, 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 flapping. Step Eagle's actually stopped going up as well. He's just kind of circling in the same position. And you can see how much heavier the vulture was from his flight. Oh, he needed to flap, and that Step Eagle just floated up on the thermal. James Richard, a very good question. Um, let's just keep watching that step eagle and I'll try and find the information that you want um, on my bird app because it's not in the book. Um, you say you're always astounded that if such an enormous bird would eat termites and why would it do that? Um, termites are, are just a brilliant, brilliant source of food. They're very fatty, which is very good uh, for energy and much more effective than trying to convert protein into energy. That's much harder to do. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the size, it's, to maintain a size like that, it's, it's obviously easy to protect yourself. And, uh, you know, termites are just a good way of maintaining. You've got to eat a lot of them. Then you want to know what they eat at home. Um, I'm just checking here. Yeah, it eats mostly harvested termites, which are those ones that move around on the ground, like I said. Um, requires <laughs> 600 to 2,200 termites per day. That's quite a lot of termites. Yeah, amazing. Mainly, otherwise, it just eats nestlings that are recently fledged, and also a little bit of carrion. So I think what you'll find is that they probably eat, uh, I'm sure there are termites in Russia, I think they probably eat termites in Russia. They probably eat a bit of carrion there, and then nestling birds. You probably find that there's a nestling bird that they eat specifically over there in the motherland. Just so beautiful to watch. And like I've said to you, you before, if ever you're feeling slightly uh, tense and you need a, 
sort of time to unleash or to calm yourself, to let go. To sit and watch a bird flying like this is the way to do it. It's such a peaceful thing to do. Shaza on YouTube, they're doing exactly what you think they are. You say, are they looking for prey while flying like that? Absolutely, especially the vulture, of course. The vulture uses his incredible eyes to spot carcasses from high up in the sky. I don't believe that step eagle is able to see individual termites from that height, but I'm sure that there are landmarks that the termite, the harvested termites probably leave that we can't necessarily see, maybe pathways. They might have some kind of a uh, infrared or infrared or ultraviolet vision that we can't use and that the termites maybe leave a trail and they can possibly see those. But yes, absolutely, they're not just flying for the fun of it. They're certainly looking for prey and things to eat. What a wonderful sighting. Right, so let's just press on. See what else we can see along this road. Very special that. We don't often see that. And, you know, being a quiet morning on the mammal front, what a tremendous thing to see, an unusual sight like that. driving slowly along here. Right, Brent apparently has got a nest of some sort of bird. Let's head across to him and we'll keep you posted on anything else we find. So we've come to check on that red-headed weaver's nest and they were present but he took off as we arrived and we were hoping he would come back but no such luck. Always built right at the extremities of branches uh, to try and make it a little bit more difficult for a snake or a harrier hawk or gymnogene to get in there. And with the entrance facing down and generally quite a long tunnel. But still very distinctly weaver shaped nest. But that no red headed weaver here. Maybe he'll be there this evening. Let's go see what else is about. handle there, Henry. Henry is a god. Uh, so his friend Cricky would like to know, are there emus in South Africa? There are not uh, any emus. Those are Australian. Uh, we have uh, the biggest bird in the world, the ostrich. And very occasionally... Now what? Now what? There's look. Leopard tracks, finally. Yeah, these are the ones Ephraim called in yesterday. They've been driven over, but not worth following. A female left the tracks. I think it's Brula from her wanderings yesterday. But sorry, Henry, it's, uh, we don't have any emus. We have ostriches, the largest bird in the world. It can be over two meters tall. is going to produce any moisture. There's clouds sitting a bit high. Uh, but as I said, James is keeping that bird list ticking this morning. Let's go see what he's got now. 
You've got to be a lot faster, I'm afraid, to get the birds there. And that was a black-headed oriole that went flying off. A beautiful golden-coloured bird. And we were trying to find the European version of it just now. And by just now, of course, I'm using South Africanism. I mean previously. Just, just, just now. You know? Just now. There, yeah, it's still in there. The birds are not easy to film, as you've noticed. Can you see it, Tibbs? No, I'm not even going to try and point it out to you. Tibbs, of course, is looking at the camera and trying to look around the place, which makes it very difficult indeed. So that was the black headed Oriole. Turned this into rather something of an ornithological safari at this stage. Given the complete absence of mammals, that's okay. Now, let's see if you can hear the black headed oriole. There. Lovely call. Liquid. Isn't that nice? Here it's a crested barbet. You see him? Yeah. This is of course next next to the tawny ebel is the most scruffy bird that we find out here. But very pretty colours. There he's calling. Hear a white broad scrub robin going. <laughs> also, hear a golden breasted bunting. It's like a buzz. Zzz. I think that's what it is. It's either that or a blue blue shrike, but I'm pretty sure it's the bunting. I actually see the bunting now. Um, I'm going to try and call it up here with my phone. It's a tiny little thing, Tibbs, like a small finch. Got it. You got it? Yeah. You're a genius. Well done. Tibbs, I can't even see it anymore. Oh, there it is. That's the golden breasted bunting. Little 1970s cycling helmet on, cleaning his beak on the tree branch. Hi. On earth did you find that with the camera, Tib? That is, that's brilliant. There he goes. Let's see if we can find that robin. Telephone bird. Now, these robins are very secretive, they are. <laughs> Sleepy one. There's a little fly catcher, Tibbs. I think that's what you, where, what are you what are you looking at, Tibbs? Is it still there? Sorry, one second. And Tibbs, the the robin is just out here, and sleepy one 
You want to know what my favorite bird out here is? I think it's this robin. I just love the call it makes. We got something. I think that's still our step eagle. It's there. Well, Tebbs is looking for the vulture. I'm just going to see if I can spot this um, white-browed scrub robin in here. This is called super advanced camera work. Super impossible in advanced camera work, trying to find tiny little animals with a super zoom. Mm -hmm. Have you got one? A small one. Now, you see, I, don't, I can't see what Tibbs is looking at. <laughs> is it, it's not the one that's calling, hey? No. Oh, there. There you go. That's a flycatcher. It's a little flycatcher. It's called a spotted flycatcher. And you know it's a spotted flycatcher from the spots that it has. Well done, Tebs. That's a really nice bird to see. Good job. Now, where is this scrub robin and why doesn't he show himself? I'm going to try and... I'm going to try and call the scrub robin with my phone. Okay, Jim, small birds up there. In that tree. Oh, yes, I think you might have the brew brew there. That's the brew brew, the one that's going. Robin is so close, I can't see him. <laughs> also being savaged by flies now. All right, let me just quickly see if I can call this Robin, make him come and sit here. There's lots going on here. There we go. that was calling has gone behind us now. Check on top of the tree there. Okay. Ah, yes, there's one on top of the tree with Antibs. That's the Brew Brew, everybody. That's the Brew Brew Shrike, the telephone bird. I'm going to turn the robin off. There, you can hear it again. beastly sunbird in there I can see flying around, but I'm not even going to attempt to try and make Tibbs fill the net. They move around so fast. I'm sure you can hear that brew brew going. Okay, let's head across to Brent. He's got a butterfly. with a butterfly and it is one we've seen before unfortunately so not a new one for the species list but good to keep it fresh in your mind that particular one is called a broad banded grass yellow uh, Yesterday I saw a lot of butterflies. Now this is my new secret butterfly hunting ground uh, in these abutilons and flannel weeds that are growing uh, on the edge of the Juma waterhole. 
So yesterday there were quite a lot of butterflies here. So I was hoping it's just warmed up a little bit that we might start seeing a few more there. There we go, a broad banded grass yellow. Let's see, and it was spotted by Andrew. And also lots of jokers, aquas, all sorts, but I think it's still a little bit too cool for all the butterflies to be in on these dis weeds on the disturbed soil. Uh, a good spot by Andrew finding what color. Oh, Andrew's on fire today. I can't see it yet. I'm going to stop. Oh, well done, Andrew. That is a joker. So they're around and they're just not flying around. Is that one dead? No, he flew there. Oh, he flew there. Okay, I thought Andrew was the dead one. Uh, so that is called a joker and you can see the little yellow flowers on the abutilon to the right that is what's attracting the butterflies to this area well done andrew again another species we have seen on the cameras before but still nice to keep them fresh in the mind and try to turn andrew francis into a butterfly expert it's going to take a lot of work there Oh, I saw another one disturbed by the Nyala. Let's go have a look there. And that one looked like it might be one we haven't caught on camera. Oh no, another joker. It was an actor, you see it? Oh, I saw a white one land. No, okay. Come on. Uh, it's, uh, it's a joker. Another joker there. Hiding behind. Andrew did see a white one. Sleepy one's been waiting for a nyala. And uh, they're off to the left there. Sleepy one. But they are young male and a female. Andrew, I think Andrew spotted another butterfly, no? No. Oh, disappointing. I'm disappointed in you, Andrew. Okay, I'll, I'll forgive you this time. Okay, well, definitely worth coming to have a look when it's a bit warmer, maybe on the sunset safari, if the sun's out. I think we're going to find a lot of butterflies in this area. Y'all are about to have a drink. And hardy dark ibis. Male in Yala. Lilac breasted roller. To help add to that bird list James has been building this morning. And there we go, pretty birdie. And we do have some helmeted guinea fowl on the ground as well. And there's a Heidi Dar Ibis and a helmeted guinea fowl. Uh, both are feeding in a lot of the buffalo dung from the Duggar boys around here, trying to find any insects that have been feeding on it. And if we keep coming left, there's also a Birchell's starling. So, not much in mammalian creatures around here at the moment, but plenty of birds. <laughs> there we go, and you hear that call? That is where Heidi Dar Abbas gets its name from. There we go. Ah, Heidi Dar, ah, Heidi Dar. Make a terrible racket. Oh, 
one in Florida. After we drew, drove through the remnants of the Juma water hole, the Juma dam, her boys are asking, how do the fish get back there um, after these very dry periods? So there will be some catfish that are able to cocoon themselves under the mud, uh, and they will be waiting for the rain. Other than that, uh, fish eggs get caught on birds' legs, uh, the aquatic bird species, and will move the fish species around again. Andrew, what do you think is on quarantine? All the animals. All the animals. Okay. Andrew says all the animals, uh, all 70 odd mammal species, uh, 24 odd carnivore species are all on quarantine at the same time, according to Andrew. I sent him a text about Yeah, so he's worried they didn't get his text about being on quarantine at exactly whatever time it is right now. Ah, and we got a few more birds. I don't know if we've seen these guys yet this morning. Top of the termite mound. Red billed, oh, it was a red, oh, there he is, red billed buffalo weaver. There's another one on the ground a bit closer to us, Andrew. There we go. So, Sarah, who's in Ohio, is wondering whether the lack of rain is the reason we're not seeing a lot of weavers. Uh, possibly they will generally like to nest over water, but not exclusively. Uh, we are seeing weavers, just not the villatine or village weavers that you might be used to seeing, the bright yellow ones. So here's another weaver species, uh, the red-billed buffalo weaver. And that look, busy looks like it's collecting nesting material at the moment. Very picky. Oh, off it goes. <laughs> so I, we are about to test Andrew's theory that all the animals are in quarantine. So far, it's looking a bit bleak, Andrew. Uh, there's actually possibly not one animal on quarantine. It is devoid of mammalian life. But I will give you a benefit of the doubt. I do see one animal on quarantine. Can you see the single animal on quarantine, Andrew? Well, it's multiple animals, but one species. One of my favorites. You see them yet, Andrew? Oh, yeah! Here we go, Andrew's excited come across a lovely colony of business of the dwarf mongoose who are just getting going. Uh, hello guys. So this is quite a big business of mongoose. Uh, it's probably easy 20 individuals in this quarantine uh, business. I'm giving a little peek. The smallest member of the carnivore family in Africa. Out on the forage. Looking for different insects to eat, as well as scorpions, small mammals birds, birds, eggs, whatever they can find. You see they have probably slept in these holes around here overnight and now that it's a bit warmer they're heading out hunting and foraging. You can hear the very high-pitched little contact calls between them. Uh, 
and there will be others that will be looking out, making sure they are not attacked from above by an eagle, like that step eagle you saw a bit earlier with James, would definitely make a meal out of a mongoose. Any busy little spot there, oh, incoming. Next one running in. There's them defecating. So across to James quickly for another bird. Beautiful little swallow, everybody. It looks to me like a juvenile barn swallow, which would be found in the UK and Europe to breed uh, during your summer. And here it just comes to provide us with an exceptional sense of joy in our summertime, flying around, catching insects. And lots of the flock that it's in are flying about the place, and he's taking a little bit of a rest on that tree. And would have flown in his first year already, would have flown the distance between Europe and South Africa. It's just quite astonishing. Um, probably with the flock, unlike the cuckoos, which know somehow to where to fly to Europe and how to fly to Europe. Somehow um, they know that, but that bird there will probably have learned from the rest of his flock. Beautiful little barn swallow. Let's head back to Brent and his mongoose, and I will keep looking along here. We're still sitting here on quarantine as this business of mongoose get mobile. And there are lots of them now. I can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. All around. There's some nice grooming over there, aren't there? That one, sorry. There you go, there's a young one and an adult. Ralph in Michigan says, um, I need to step up my game. James Eagle Eye Henry is out birding me today. Well, Ralph, you've got to let him win some of the, 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 little, the little, little, little challenges. Uh, otherwise, he wouldn't play with me anymore. So, these early morning sessions are quite important for dwarf mongoose. So, a lot of the greeting, and you can see that one at the back rubbing that one there. Giving, it, giving itself a clean. So these little grooming sessions happen before they head out foraging. And you'll notice there's always one or two mongoose with their heads up checking for potential predators. some grooming happening in the little hollow there. So they'll defend their little home ranges viciously against other dwarf mongoose. Sure, that female on the far left looks like she could be pregnant. She's So maybe, I'm not sure, she's just had a very big meal. But if she is pregnant, uh, that would mean she is the alpha female. And they also, like wild dogs, only the alpha pair of mongoose breed. And all the rest of the individuals in the group look after the babies. Highly, highly social little carnivore. So 
Yeah, well, we'll leave them to get on with their morning. We shall do the same. Now, we are still testing Andrew Francis's theory that all the animals are on quarantine. So far, the only animal on quarantine is a dwarf mongoose. I'm hoping for Andrew's sake there might be at least one more. Otherwise, when we get back, ah, oh, you are lucky, Andrew. Ah, oh, you are lucky, lucky, lucky. There's some wildebeest with the babies. Let's go have a quick look. But there's no impala. I still think you should be punished. Babies are left. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That happened. There's an extra baby, it seems. A late, a late birth. So instead of decreasing in numbers, it looks like the vulvies have increased. when they do that. Next one incoming, Andrew. Oh. <laughs> Spotted some giraffe poo and decided that was definitely something that would cause it to halt and walk around. <laughs> so, it looks like the wildy population of Juma has increased, not decreased. Counted to ten babies this time, when the last time only nine. There is a wonderful Afrikaans word, and it's a lot lamaki. Basically, translated means a late lamb. So we have a lot lamaki wildebeest. So let's try and count them. Which side do you want to start on? Right or left, Danny? Just go left. Just go left. Yeah. Let's go to the left. Yeah. It's going to be sometimes quite difficult. Wait, you can just see legs and through the bushes. Uh, let's try and move forward. Yeah. One, to the right, two and three. And there's one, and there's two, you can just see the back there, two and three, and four. I think that's five. Five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, I got ten twice. And it's difficult to see because they are moving constantly, but it looks like quarantines of all these have definitely added another member. As you can see, they're already starting eat, eating, a, a started eating some grass, uh, even though they are, they nurse for eight months, so it's eight months before they're weaned. Um, if a mother loses a calf early on, she will actually let last year's babies suckle uh, for another year, so sometimes they can even take 16 months to wean. But so far, luck is in the favor of this wildebeest herd because we don't have any lions around at the moment. Off he goes. Oh, look at it go. Right. Oh, coming back, Andrew. Let's get right to that side. Dylan, a big welcome to Safari Live. Dylan is a brand new viewer on YouTube and would like to know what are these animals? Uh, these are blue wildebeest. Uh, Dylan, one of the larger antelope species we get here in the Sabi Sands private game reserve. And they've just had their babies. They only breed once a year. So it's wildebeest baby season at the moment. If 
funny looking creatures uh, in quite a few different African folklores. And the wildebeest was the last in, and the lazy, and the la uh, he was the latest to arrive at the creator when he was handing out horns and skins. So he only got to pick what was left over. And that's why they have such a funny appearance. Very much niche feeders. They need short grass. They don't like long grass. And selective feeders. So they will actually feed on different grass species between the other grasses, uh, where there's something like a, a zebra or a buffalo, which is a bulk grazer, will eat, sort of munch everything all together. The wildebeest will actually pick out different grass species with its lips, with a preference for your decreaser species, which are the highest in sh sugar. So we have another new viewer on YouTube, a big warm welcome uh, to Ginger Fuzzy Kitty on YouTube. Uh, and she would like to know whether the animals are scared of the car. As you can see, they are not. We're sitting a couple of feet from them and they're carrying on their daily business as if we weren't even here. And we don't drive too close or, and we let the animals come closer to us rather. Uh, we don't chase them or anything like that, so they have no reason to fear the vehicles. So isn't it wonderful at the quarantine kids have increased in number and hopefully we will be seeing more of them there goes Jemps and Tebs and Tebs' friend who's visiting there we go the Wildies I think will possibly be around uh, here in the, on the Sunset Safari as well uh, oh there we go the little guys Quite often in the evenings, we've had some great times with them chasing each other about and playing. Oh, so sweet. You can see the little horns popping out as well. So, it's been a little bit of a quiet on the big, hairy and scary front on the Sunrise Safari, but James has kept you going with birds and we've tried our best to keep up and James did a sterling and Tebs did a sterling job. It's been lots of fun. Don't forget, we're gonna be back in a few hours for the Sunset Safari, so please join James and myself. Last few seconds, let's have a look at those wildebeests.